We're here with Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter and Square. Pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. So this journey from being a coder mm -hmm. to the head of two uber successful companies, multi-billion dollar companies, trace the pathway from that to this. So I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and my parents always stuck by the city. I always stayed in the city. Uh, most of the city was moving out to the suburbs. And St. Louis has had some rough times, and I really love that they stood by it the entire time. And because of that, I developed this fascin fascination with cities, how they worked. I loved urban environments and downtowns, and um, it grew in this fascination with maps. And uh, I would just obsess over maps. I would hang them on my bedroom walls. And, uh, and then my parents got a, a Macintosh in 1984 and a PC Junior in 1984. And I saw some graphics on it, and I saw a map at one point on it. And what, what I loved about maps is I would just wonder what was happening in this area or what was going on, you know, what, what couldn't I see, what, what was actually in that location. And the computer was interesting because it allowed the maps to move. So I just had to, I had to be able to do that. And um, I taught myself how to program so I could draw a map on the screen. Uh, and I just learned the bare minimum that it took to do, to draw the map. And then the bare minimum that it took to move a dot around. And then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And uh, before I knew it, I was programming. And uh, I, was, uh, I was drawing on a computer, which I thought was just awesome. My parents also had this, um, this uh, police scanner and CB radio, and we would listen to ambulances and fire trucks and police cars and black cars and taxis, and they're always reporting where they are and where they're going and uh, you know, what they're doing, and I just thought that was fascinating. But I took that, those reports, those updates, and I actually programmed them into my map, and I could actually watch a police car, car go from one point to another point. And I thought this was awesome because I could actually now see what was happening in the city. I could see a city live and breathe, and uh, it was certainly by, by function. But um, what I learned over time when I was about 17 or 18 is this, there's a whole industry around this. It's called dispatch. And um, I, once I realized that, I found the biggest dispatch firm I could find in the world. It happened to be in New York City, which I always wanted to move to. And, um, and I got a job there. And, uh, and, uh, and then I was programming dispatch systems for the largest dispatch firm in the world, and I could see all of New York, and I could see all these taxi cabs go to the Met, and I knew that a show was going on. So little by little, I was putting together pieces of the city and what people were doing in the city. And then I kept working in that field for a while. I moved out here in 99, and in about 2001, I realized I was missing one key element of the city. It was the people. Where are the people? I, I was only people that were driving trucks and fire trucks and police cars and whatnot. Where are the people? And, uh, and the simple idea is, what if anyone could update where they are, what they're doing, uh, what they're thinking? Um, and uh, I built a little prototype in 2001. It's the wrong time, wrong technology. 2006, SMS got really big in this country and brought the idea back up, and that became Twitter. So the very simple idea of, what are you doing? What's happening? Uh, where are you going? Where are you? Uh, and little by little, as more and more people did it, we could see the city but we could see the world and what people thought about the world and what people thought about a basketball game or a protest or uh, any event that they were in or just what's happening today. It's Super Tuesday today and what they think about um, the candidates and the, and the presidential run. So um, that's kind of how I got started. It was more of an approach of I did whatever it took, learned whatever I had to learn to build what I wanted to use and what I wanted to see. So let me just ask a follow-up question before Peter comes in, and that is, today you lead before you did something quite technical. Mm -hmm. How has that transitioned, or do you still think of your role in a technical way? Um, I still, I guess I still think of it as a technical, as a, in a technical way. I, you know, my, my parents were actually entrepreneurs. My father started a pizza restaurant when he was 19. My mother owned a coffee store. Um, my father owned a medical device manufacturing company for a while, still does actually. Um, but I never really wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to build a company. But 
at one point you realize, well, if I want to continue to work in this work that I want to see and I want to continue to build this idea, the most efficient means of doing it is, in this country, a corporation, a company. And uh, it wasn't just about what I could do, it was about what other people could do with me and, and what I could do with them. Um, and then there's another, there's another learning, which is, well, what does it take for me to build a team? What do I have to learn to build a team? And what do I have to learn to build to um, in, encourage other people to do this work that I'm so passionate about? Are they passionate about it? Uh, and then what does it mean to have a company? What does it mean to be a CEO? I, I learned all that more because um, it felt like the next step to building something bigger and bigger and bigger and having more, more impact. So that's, that's been my approach and my mindset is what's, what's blocking me from the next step. And, um, and that's what I love about the definition of an entrepreneur is you, you, um, you take significant risk in order to see what you want to see in the world. You do whatever it takes to see what you, what you want to see in the world. Usually it's financial risk, but it's also personal risk or reputational risk, uh, confidence risk, learning something new. Um, and, uh, and we just constantly are learning about how to build and how to scale. And it turns out that the best way to scale something broadly is not as an individual, but with a team of people. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, the best way to lead a team of people is to is to show uh, impact of what you're building, and to show how it actually impacts someone you're serving, uh, and what they feel about it. And we've seen this both with Twitter and Square. We don't really have to sell the story when people are using this to talk about what's happening in Iran right now, or people are using it to actually start a business or grow their business. Uh, it sells itself. Um, so, what do they need next, uh, and what? And, and then we have to make decisions about what technologies are coming to bear and what's new, what, what's changed, what are our competitors doing, and how are we building something that uniquely serves our customers in a, in a new way that they value. And if they keep valuing it, we'll have jobs. And if they don't, then we'll have to go do something else. Entrepreneur and leader, corporate leader, they seem, there's a paradox, you say, that you move from one and, and gain influence and capability in the other. Um, what is the hardest part in moving from the entrepreneur who themselves fashions all the problem and the solutions and kind of engages the seminal elements and then suddenly has to lead a large group of people through other people, not just yeah. through themselves? What is the skill set that is you know, different? And not just the aptitude, but the attitude that you have to have when you're leading a large organization. I think the, the attitude was the, the hardest thing for me. It's, it's more trust. I think it's you know it's it's giving something up that you saw from the beginning and you built and you made all the decisions around. So early on, I wanted to be in every single decision, and and then you realize I don't actually have the best information. I'm actually not the expert in this particular field. Um, and why you know why did we hire this person to do that if I'm just going to help make the decision? Um, so it's more taking on a mindset of. It's not my job to make the decision, it's my job to make sure that decisions are being made. It's my job to make sure that decisions are being made with context of who we're serving and uh, context of what the industry is doing and where the world is going and where we're going and our place in it. And also that we're building a dynamic that decisions um, are made uh, in a very rich way, but also a way that is constantly raising the bar on itself. Because if we're we're just making the same decisions again and again and again. We're not doing anything interesting and we'll, we'll become irrelevant because the world will move on and, and make better decisions and, and we won't. So I think the biggest shift in, in mindset is really around giving up the decision-making ability um, and trusting that you'll, you'll arrive at better outcomes because you did. The conceit around the entrepreneur is they can't be risk averse. They have to. They have to be willing to confront risk and and failure to some some extent. And the executive has to manage against failure, so to so to speak. Um, how do you remain nimble? How does a company like Twitter remain nimble and agile? So many competitors, other people trying to in, engage in the space. Uh, how do you bring that in, inception of remaining nimble, remaining you know? Um, challenge your own incumbency. How do you bring that into, an, into a corporate institution? I think that energy is always emergent. 
in the company, and I think the best way to do that is show it off. Point it out, celebrate it, and then spread it to the rest of the company. One of my favorite authors is uh, William Gibson, and he has this amazing quote, which is, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And you can apply that to companies too. The future is already in the company, it's just not evenly distributed. So what is our job? What's our job as leaders is to make sure that we distribute evenly the future and that we test it against our theories and we, we build consensus around it. Um, I think there's a natural desire for agility uh, and it's often blocked um, because either it's not listened to or it's not celebrated, it's not shown off, it's not spread around. And I think it also goes in phases. There will be some phases of a company or organization that just can't handle it and some phases where you can and it's okay uh, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. It's just a, a phase of the company but should always strive for, I think, looking inwardly and, and also um, uh, looking for reconsiderations of ourselves. I, I think the, the, the quality I admire the most is curiosity, just asking that question why, that very simple question asked but really hard one to answer. And the people who answer, who are comfortable and confident enough in, their, in themselves to say, I don't know, because if they can get to an I don't know, instead of pointing to an authority of, well, this is what they said, this is what the industry wants, this is how they made it, and we can't go any further. If they can get to an I don't know, then there's at least the desire to do the work to figure out why they don't know. And then everything just unfolds. So asking that question why and having people who ask the question why all the time and are comfortable with uh, I don't know, that's who we invest in. That those are the folks that really change the dynamic of the company and the organization. And um, they're not that rare. And, and, and when, when you point it out once, everyone says, ah, that's, that's what I want to be. That's okay. I love it. And I want to keep doing more and more of that stuff. A lot of that leadership is also radiating back from the group. And you work in two distinct groups, in the morning at Twitter, in the afternoon at Square. I think that's the schedule you keep. Uh, do you radiate differently in those two places? Do you lead differently? I don't know if I lead differently. I, I probably radiate differently because I think all oh, that's really perception of the people that that um, perceive you. And uh, I think you know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So however people interpret things, they they interpret it. Um, I think both companies have a different purpose and they have consistent underlying values but they're differently interpreted um, and uh, I only know one way to to be and one way to lead and that's that's what I am. Does so it come out differently in the? It probably does. Um, I'm not sure how <laughs> but it probably does. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's also a phasal thing in the company. And one company is seven years old, and another company is ten, about to be ten years old. So um, they're they're both going through very very different challenges and very different times. Um, and uh, and I imagine that that definitely comes out differently. Global platforms like Twitter you know, have such reach and such touch, and you're the leader of it. Do you feel that the institution and the platform? has a responsibility uh, uh, that's, that's beyond any one person using the system? And how do you engineer that so that you're responsible? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we, Twitter's and, and Square, they're, and any organization that, that you know, ultimately succeeds is bigger than any one person. And I want to build something that is timeless. I want to build something that uh, lives generation after generation, generation certainly after, after I pass away. Um, and I think that's first having the intention that you want to build that structure and then how do you build it into the DNA. It's really empowering people around the organization to own the decisions and, uh, and it's not just the people in the organization, it's also people outside the organization. So I, I think Twitter is really unique in the sense that a lot of the, a lot of the innovation and the invention actually came from the people using the service. So the at name, the hashtag, the retweet, uh, the tweet storm, all of these things were actually invented by people using the service, not, not inside the company. And, uh, and I think you know, the company has been really customer focused. I think it's really seen a pattern. It's seen what people want to do and it's understood and it's pushed itself to understand why 
it wants to do it, and then we've made those behaviors easier, and it just flourishes. So um, as long as we're really looking at what people want to do with the service and, and what, how they're being creative and how they're being inventive, um, and we're meeting that and we're making it easier for them, um, we're, doing, we're doing the right thing. And uh, I think Twitter is, is, um, is interesting in that it is a tool for uh, expression as well, and it's really stood for freedom of expression. One of the things I'm proudest of the company it's just not the tool that we've built, but also what we've um, stood for, um, specifically from a policy and legal standpoint. Um, the, the team has, uh, has really stood for the voice of the people using it in every market um, and, uh, and really fought hard uh, to maintain freedom of expression, freedom of speech across the platform. I think it's you know, always been known for freedom of expression, for speaking truth to power, and for empowering dialogue, and uh, and we really honor that, and we have a very creative and aggressive uh, legal and policy team that upholds those rights, um, and isn't afraid uh, to to do the right thing. Great. Thank you for being Thanks. here. Thank you. Thank you.